For everyone who clicked on to this worship service today, especially those who have never worshiped with us, I welcome you to this Easter service, and I trust that God will meet you right where you are. Remember, many of the stories in the Bible, even today's scripture, did not take place in religious buildings like temples or synagogues or what we call churches today, but they took places in the markets, in homes, on farms, on the streets. Today's story probably happened in a home, definitely not in a religious building. So if you're not used to worshiping anywhere except a church building, I trust that you can still hear God's word and have an encounter with him today, wherever you are watching from. This has been a strange Holy Week for me. While driving the streets of Nashville one morning, then that evening clicking on photos of empty streets of Manila that my Filipino friends had posted on Facebook and Instagram, I was reminded of my first few Holy Weeks in Manila in the mid 80s. In those days, it seemed like the whole city closed during Holy Week, especially on Saturday. The streets were empty, no buses, no jeepneys, no cars, no people. The way I remember it, there was really nothing to do other than spiritual reflection. In those days, of course, there was no internet, so there were no Netflix. Uh, there were only three TV stations, and the regular programming was canceled and replaced with religious shows. Same with the movie theaters. The feeling in those days during Holy Week was one of the seriousness of religious soul-searching and of spiritual reflection. Many people discovered a new and fresh relationship with God as they stopped everything from work to entertainment to go through the rhythms of seeking God with a new vigor. When we do that, when we stop and press pause, whether we're forced to or we do it on purpose, and we do that and seek God, God tends to show up in new ways. If we seek Him, He promises to be found. While the empty streets remind me of past Easter's in Manila, the feeling is very different this time. This Holy Week, religious reflection and soul searching has been replaced in many people with fear and anxiety and uncertainty and disappointment even. I understand why this is the case. This global health crisis and looming financial crisis is reason enough for fear, anxiety, uncertainty, and disappointment. This stuff is real and no one seems to have a solution or a way out. And nobody really knows when it'll end. We've even had to learn new vocabulary, like social distancing, flattening the curb, herd immunity, contact tracing, fomite, zoonotic, and the most dreaded of all new words, COVID-19. Along with the new vocabulary, we've dusted off some old words that we would just as soon leave alone but we're being forced to use them. Words like outbreak and epidemic and pandemic, lockdown, quarantine, and even martial law in parts of the world. This is not the Easter any of us imagined when the new year started. Yet here we are, unable to gather together physically, so we're doing our Easter weekend online. If we could find a DeLorean and go back in time 2,000 years, we would observe that the original Holy Week felt much like this one. The people, like today, were filled with fear, anxiety, uncertainty, and especially disappointment. But it was not primarily because of a health crisis or a financial crisis. Oh, sure, they feared for their lives. Uh, their rabbi had just been brutally executed, and any one of them could be next. So yes, there was the possibility of death just like now but that wasn't their main concern. They were also experiencing a financial crisis. After all, three years prior to this, they had left everything, sold their businesses, walked away, everything they owned to follow Jesus. They probably had no idea what to do next with their life, what kind of career or where, where things were going now, but they had a more pressing crisis than the health crisis and the financial crisis. The crisis they were experiencing in the Bible story we're about to read was much worse than disease, death, or loss of income. Their crisis had eternal consequences. Many today are in the same situation. This global health crisis and financial crisis brought on by the coronavirus pandemic is creating a faith crisis for many. They feel the need for divine intervention, but no matter what they do, 
they still feel far from God and they still feel out of control. Today's Bible story is about a Holy Week faith crisis and how the Easter message of the resurrection of Christ resolved that crisis. The resurrection did not necessarily resolve the health crisis. It didn't then and it won't now. There was still a good chance that the people in our story might die. It also did nothing to resolve the financial crisis, but it definitely solved the most pressing, most serious crisis, which was their faith crisis. Our story is found in the last chapter of Luke. If you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 36 through 39. If you don't have a Bible with you, the verses will show up at the bottom of this screen. Here we go, beginning in verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father to you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Our text starts with these words, as they were talking about these things. What things were they talking about? These disciples were talking about the events of Holy Week. They were talking about Palm Sunday that we call it, that first Sunday. The crowds that wholeheartedly praised Jesus when he entered Jerusalem and threw palm branches down. Then they went on to talk about Monday when Jesus cleansed the temple and Jesus tends to cleanse when we allow places of worship to become polluted by love of money and idolatry. On Tuesday, those same religious leaders who praised him on Palm Sunday now turn against Jesus. How quickly the crowds turn. One day you're popular, the next day you're hated. On Wednesday, we have the dramatic contrast of Mary's sacrificial worship you know the story of the alabaster jar that was so valuable and she poured it out in sacrificial worship. That sacrifice of worship compared to Judas' decision to betray Jesus for what we later know amounted to 30 pieces of silver. Much less value than the worship and the sacrifice that Mary made. What a contrast. Then on Thursday, Jesus serves the Last Supper to his disciples. He goes to the Gethsemane to pray. The disciples fall asleep, but Jesus prays that powerful prayer, the prayer that God would always answer for any one of us, not my will, but your will be done. That brings us to Friday. And remember, these disciples were discussing all these events. Friday is the day of the cross and the death of Jesus. Then we get to Saturday. Saturday is the day when fear and anxiety and uncertainty and especially disappointment hit those disciples in full force. And it says, as they were talking about these things, this fear and this anxiety and this uncertainty and this disappointment came to the surface and the reality of their faith crisis was on full display through the words of their mouth. Verse 37 gives us the words of a faith crisis. It tells us that they were startled and frightened and they thought they saw a ghost. Verse 38 says they were troubled and doubts were rising in their hearts. Doubts don't just come in huge masses that overwhelm us. 
they gradually rise up in the heart. They were startled, they were fearful, they were troubled, doubts were rising. They were in a faith crisis. On Palm Sunday, just a little over a week prior to this, these people had high hopes. Their dreams and hopes have now been crushed when they saw their rabbi, their friend, their Messiah, their savior, their king, die on a Roman cross. They were so crushed that they don't even recognize Jesus now when he walks into their crisis and speaks directly to them. How did they get past their faith crisis? How did the facts of the resurrection change their crisis into a cause? What difference did the resurrection make when they realized that Jesus, their teacher, was no longer dead, but alive? Our text today reveals three ways the resurrection made a difference in the lives of these disciples and three ways the resurrection or the Easter story and the Easter experience will impact our lives, no matter what crisis we're facing. Number one, because of the resurrection, we can enjoy his presence. Verse 36 tells us, while they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them. Jesus himself, not someone else, Jesus himself stood among them. Think about that phrase, among them. Verse 15 says that while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself, there's that phrase again, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Both of these verses use the phrase Jesus himself. In both of these verses, Jesus speaks. In both of these verses, these followers of Jesus are not even aware of his presence or that the voice they're hearing is the voice of Jesus. How often is Jesus himself among us, drawing near to us, talking to us. But we're so filled with fear, we're so given over to anxiety, we're, we've accepted uncertainty and disappointment, so much so that we don't recognize his presence and we don't hear his voice. In my case, I think that happens pretty often. Verse 39, Jesus himself says, see my hands. Because remember, when his presence comes, his voice comes. But what he says is, see my hands. This reminds me of Isaiah 49, verse 15, that asked the question, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? This is a rhetorical question. The, the answer is, of course not. Uh, if there's a nursing child in the room and that child is hungry, you can't forget. You can't not know that child's there. They are usually quite loud and quite insistent. It says a woman is not gonna forget that child who's hungry. Verse 16, Isaiah 49 says, Behold, in the context of can a woman forget that child and not have compassion? Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. That's an interesting phrase. Every time God looks at his hands, what does he see? This was a prophetic picture. Isaiah, more than any other Old Testament prophet, prophesied about the Messiah. And he's looking way into the future. And he's talking about God's hands engraved with our names, or maybe even our faces. Every time he looks at his hands, what does he see? He sees your name engraved with a nail scar. He sees a picture of you engraved. Engraving is a cutting into something, not just on the surface. Remember the story of the prodigal son earlier in Luke's gospel? The son disrespects his father, takes an early inheritance, squanders the money with immorality, then he comes to his senses and returns home. The story tells us that the father reaches out his hands to the son. Now, sometimes when we think about God reaching out his hand, too often we think about it's a finger pointing out everything we've done wrong or a finger pointing out mistakes and saying, I told you so, but that's not the hand of God. Sometimes we think of an open hand that's a slap, a humiliating slap of shame. Sometimes we think of the hand as a clenched fist with a violent punch. But when God looks at his hands, and in the story here that we're looking at in Luke 24, when Jesus says, look at my hands, it's not that finger pointing out everything wrong. It's not that slap of shame. It's not a violent fist. It's the same hands that are engraved with our names with a nail engraving. The hands the prodigal son saw were the hands of forgiveness and acceptance. They were extended to him in a warm, loving embrace. 
When Jesus said, look at my hands, his disciples saw the same hands the prodigal son saw with their names engraved with a nail. They saw the nail scar. Because of the scars on his hands and his feet, we get invited to enjoy his presence. But that's not all the resurrection does for us. The presence is amazing, but that's just the starting point. We also get invited to engage his purpose. Verses 46 and 47 say this, It is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Forgiving sins was his mission. Forgiveness of sins is his message. Proclaiming forgiveness of sins to all nations, that's his purpose, and that's the purpose he invites us into with him. He calls us to experience the forgiveness of sins and engage his purpose of proclaiming that forgiveness to our neighbors and to all nations. How do we experience forgiveness? Verse 47 attaches forgiveness of sins to this word repentance. Other verses attach forgiveness to faith. Why does one time it say repentance and one time faith? Sometimes it says both. Repentance and faith are two different sides to the same coin. Repentance means to turn away from sin. Faith is when we turn toward God. We can't turn away from something without turning to something. Every time I turn my back on this, I turn my face to that. And so repentance is this turning away from sin so that we can turn to God. We can't turn to God without turning away from sin, and we can't turn away from sin without turning to God. Forgiveness is received when we repent of sin and put faith in Christ, or when we turn to God and turn from sin. Repentance is a biblical word that is often used by Jesus, Paul, and other apostles. Unfortunately, it's often confused with the word penance, which is a word that's never mentioned anywhere in the Bible. In some ways, repentance and penance are exact opposites. Penance is when we're, we sin, we know we did, we feel guilty, so we do some good work, and that good work and that good deed, whether it's a prayer or some physical act, but it, it relieves us of that feeling of guilt, and then we continue on. The good deed relieves the guilt for a while, but when we repent, we're not just covering it or making up for it or trying to balance it. We're actually turning away from it and turning to God. It's repentance and faith. Because of the resurrection, we're invited to enjoy His presence, to engage His purpose. But there's one more. We're invited to experience His power. I want to read verse 49 together. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Now, Luke wrote the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And we're in the last chapter of Luke. And when you go to Acts 1, that's like chapter 25 of Luke. There were times in history when Acts and Luke were put in together as one book, and then they were separated as two. So the same person, Luke, when he says in verse 49, that we'll be clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit, then he goes in the next chapter, or the first chapter of Acts, verse, verse uh, 8 of chapter 1, he says that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us, and we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But there's again talking about this power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 49, he says, just wait until you get clothed with power. When I think about this, um, I, when I have time, like to ride my motorcycle. And there's a couple of things I do when I think about this idea of clothed with power. I don't ever get on my motorcycle without putting on proper gear. I put on an armored jacket. I put on motorcycle boots. I put on uh, pants that are designed to, if I fall, they, they, they don't tear and, and they're padded and I have gloves and I have a helmet with a full mask and face. I don't get on there without putting the right clothes on because it's protective while I'm on the motorcycle. Here Jesus is saying, there's coming a time when you can be clothed with power. Now, it's a lot of work to put all of that motorcycle gear on, but it's worth it. 
And there's a lot of work every day to be clothed in the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't just automatically happen. We get up, we fill our hearts and minds with God's word. We, 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 we praise, we pray, we speak his words. We clothe ourselves. We put on the Holy Spirit day after day and we're refilled and we're filled to overflowing. So throughout history, the church has clothed itself with the power of the Spirit in order to serve as a witness to Christ and His love in the midst of wars and epidemics, and it's had a tremendous impact on church history. On this Easter service, if you want to accept God's invitation to you to enjoy His presence, not live at a distance, but take the invitation to live in His presence, to engage His purpose, not living for your purpose or other people's purpose for your life, but figuring out what God has you here on this earth for. And if you want to experience His power, I want to pray with you right now. I want to pray a prayer based on Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And that scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I want you to pray this prayer in your heart with me right now. Heavenly Father, I repent and turn away from all sin. I turn to you in faith. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I believe I am justified and saved by your sacrifice and by your goodness, not by my sacrifice and my goodness. Please help me recognize your presence and your voice and fill me with the power of your spirit so I can live a life that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you experience the power of his resurrection, not only on Easter Sunday, but on every Sunday and every other day of the week for the rest of your life. Amen.